Well, uh, welcome again, everyone. My, my name is Daniel, I'm one of the instigators of R and DAO. We are a research and development DAO, researching DAOs funded by DAO or DAO and so on. And as we try to explore this question of what's the future of organizations and where, what are better ways to empower humane collaboration, which is our mission statement, one of the things we have realized is that sharing knowledge across the different silos, across the, the different disciplines and pockets that have been looking at these quite complicated question of how we humans can better work together is, is really fundamental. And so the purpose of these talks is to precisely to share knowledge, bring people together and spark conversations. Today, uh, I'm quite excited to bring uh, Francesca with us, who's been working in the self-management field for for quite a while, I'll pass it on to her to share a little bit more about her background. Uh, so she'll give us a presentation. And then at the end of that, we'll open it up for questions. But importantly, and hear me out, not only for questions, you're also very much invited to bring your own ideas, your own thoughts and comments. We want this to be a multi multilateral discussion, not just a Q&A. So we'll start with a good prompt, a good uh, to spark the, the conversation, but we don't stop there. So please feel free to think over all your questions. If there is anything that you'd like to ask, you're, you can also write it down in the chat in the meantime, but we'll take questions uh, at the end. So with that being said, thank you all for coming. And Francesca, thank you very much for joining us. Over to you. Yeah, thank you, Daniel, and great to be here and to see all your faces, see some familiar faces and uh, some new ones. So that's always a great combination. So yeah, um, I guess really briefly about me before I jump into the, the meaty topic that I'm quite excited to share some ideas on and then dive into the discussion with you all after probably like 20, 25 minutes. Let's see how, how long I take. Um, so I've pretty much been working in this field of, let's say, new ways of organizing um, for about 10 years. And I really got started in the WeShare network that some of you have heard of and mentioned earlier, that really was sort of the, uh, the experimentation ground that I landed in right after my studies, where I just had the opportunity that I'm really grateful for to just experiment and learn by doing with sort of a, uh, an ambition to create a new type of organization just based on, on what the people in this community that was gathering around certain shared values and sort of a, a vision for society to, to just create the kind of workplace that we needed. And so um, I'm, I'm a person who isn't really that much into theory, I gotta say, I'm very much a, a practical learner. I like just applying things and sort of taking concepts and like immediately uh, doing it. So I would say that most of the, the knowledge that I have comes out of like this big combination of taking lots of different bits and pieces that I've learned from other people, from other groups, and, and then had the opportunity to just apply and, and see what happens. And so I guess um, after quite a few years in the WeShare community that I spent a lot of time helping develop, I had a whole sort of phase where I went like out into the world more and started exploring other networks and communities that had evolved sort of in parallel with similar types of uh, missions and also ways of organizing. And that's when I started seeing a lot of really interesting patterns around the challenges that those groups had encountered. One of them was especially the Inspiral Network from New Zealand that I uh, sort of got quite involved in around uh, 2016. And so what was really interesting is sort of in going to these different networks to see how similar some of the, the stumbling blocks were that we had run into and to just really start bringing together a lot of the knowledge that was there and starting to see, okay, how can we actually um, learn from this and, and get to the next level in terms of how we actually make this way of organizing work? Because of course there were a lot of uh, challenges and growing pains and uh, difficult lessons learned. And so what was quite interesting is after, after a few years of being in a bunch of those networks, I then started getting a bit more interested in what was happening in, in the Web3 space. And I would say was quite involved at the very early stages of some DAOs. I definitely uh, have sort of taken a bit more of a distance since then. Like I haven't been as involved in the last two years and since it's a very, very fast moving space, uh, things are changing like every month. 
But what was really interesting to see in, in the Web3 space is that it sort of felt like another, another phase happening of many people around the world that are super smart, that are very passionate and have really strong values, wanting to address these questions of how to organize differently and better. And going through some of the same growing pains and the same challenges that I had seen a lot of the networks I was part of um, going through those again. And in many cases, reinventing things from scratch and, and having similar challenges, which probably we also, um, I wanna humbly say, like in WeShare, we probably could have learned a whole lot by looking more backwards and looking to other groups and structures out there and what they were doing. So part of, uh, I guess, the reason I do the work that I do now is to really help all of the different networks, communities, organizations out there that are trying to do new ways for organizing to actually tap into all this knowledge and all of these important lessons we've learned and, and to actually start building that knowledge and growing it so that we can figure out these difficult questions and, and get better at it. So for the last five years, the, the main space that I've been doing this work within is a collective that I started called Greater Than. And so we're one of our missions is to help uh, these new ways of organizing really uh, succeed and for the, the different organizations out there that are trying this to be able to maybe make some leaps forward and not have to learn everything over again from, from scratch. So I guess um, that sort of brings me right into why I picked the topic of this session, um, the, the leadership myths and misconceptions. And that is that through the work that we've been doing with Greater Than, with a lot of different organizations that want to implement, often they call it self-management, that there's so many, uh, I guess, misunderstandings or certain stories about what this is that keep popping up and that sort of every time we enter a new group, they, they show up again, and then you have to sort of debunk it and uh, like re-clarify what is actually the intention uh, of this self-management thing, if, for lack of a better word of what we're going to call it here. But so I thought it would be really interesting, especially in the context of Web3 also, to, to bring some of those very common myths and misconceptions that we keep hearing again and again into the space and, and use them as a bit of a kickoff for discussion. So I think with that, um, I want to share four myths with you and give a bit of a yeah context around what those are and, and how they show up. So myth number one. <laughs> um, so a lot of organizations uh, that are trying to do self-management, let's say, um, I think that they they come often from a, a tradition or maybe a past where there's this idea of management in a traditional sense where, ah, you're not seeing the slides, of course. I'm sorry. Thank you for the reminder. Now I need to actually start sharing the slides. Uh, here we go. Does everyone see the slides? Yeah, seeing Great. this. Thank you. Okay, so myth number one. So leading means taking control, right? So I was talking about this, uh, this tradition of, of management that we often conflate with leadership and that is very much connected to this idea that, um, yeah, the leader is taking control and that they're in some way exerting power over others, that there's maybe even like some coercion or force, which is really also based on this general idea that comes from uh, like that we see historically in, in management that also comes from how society is structured, from the idea that we have a military that can actually um, enforce things with certain force, with, with power, right? Um, but yeah, so basically this idea uh, that the only way that I can lead if I'm leading, that I'm taking control and somehow doing something to others, that I'm exerting power over them, obviously makes it quite scary. <laughs> to uh, step into leadership, if that's what you think it is, or you think that that's the only way to do it. And so often something we hear people say is, I can't step in and do anything about this problem I'm seeing in this organization because we're self-managing and like, we don't wanna, we don't wanna be taking control and telling others you have to do this and, and imposing something. And so that actually brings me very closely to um, this really key idea 
that uh, a thinker called Mary Parker Follett already was bringing out in the 1920s, which is pretty incredible, which really underlies uh, this whole concept, I would say, which is that we're trying to shift from an idea of power over to power with. And many of you have maybe heard about this before. Um, I think that sometimes people switch from power over to like power under, they sort of just like flip it. But the idea of power with is really this, this uh, physical notion of stepping in together and that all the different individuals in the room, they, they hold different types of power and they're, they're holding it together in that way. Um, and I think that there's something very challenging about this concept of power with that it's hard to intellectually really understand it, is my impression. I feel like it's something that you can energetically feel if you've been in the experience of it, it somehow makes sense. But yeah, that is really the this key underlying idea that we're trying to step into power with. And so that brings me to the second myth, which I would say is probably the biggest myth of them all. Like if there's one you want to uh, remember, it's this one, which is this idea that uh, if we're getting rid of managers, we're getting rid of leadership completely, and that there's just there's no leadership which I would say is actually exactly the opposite of what we want, which is we want lots of leadership. And so um, I think that what's really interesting is that many of the groups that we work with, uh, I, I never recall ever mentioning that when we're doing self-management, there's not going to be leadership anymore. But somehow this idea that there is no leadership is always there. There's always many people that show up with it and saying, oh, but, but there's no leadership, right? Like, so if that's not okay to do that. And I wonder sometimes maybe it's coming from sort of, you know, tradition of democracy and thinking like, okay, so uh, everyone has to be equal and these are democratic structures that, that are influencing that. I also think that many organizations that choose a path of doing self-management maybe have like very bad experiences with management from the past or even like traumas around that type of leadership that's that's coercive. And so they tend to sort of completely push it away and reject it. So there's a real fear of anyone stepping into leadership. And I really think that this not happening, people not being able to step in is uh, like really to the detriment of a lot of really great organizations and, and their missions and what they're trying to do. And so one really key point here is I think about this idea of equality, because um, a lot of people, they always say, ah, yes, uh, there's no leadership because we must all be equal. We're all the same. Uh, and uh, in, the, in the spiral dynamics uh, speak, if you're at all familiar with spiral dynamics, this is a very green concept. So basically, um, everyone has to get the same share. Um, it's very like, yeah, just egalitarian. And so I think what's really important is that we're, we're having a bit of a conflation happening there of equality on many different planes, when actually uh, we, need to, we need to be more differentiated. And I think that Frédéric Laloux actually articulates this quite interestingly, which is that when we, when we talk about equality, um, what, where we definitely want to have equality is every individual's value as a human, right? Like we are all... Um, equally valid living beings here with the right to be here, with the right to express ourselves, to be creative, all of those things. Like we are equal from that like dignity humanist perspective. But on the other hand, where we're not equal is when we think about the roles we might hold, the contribution, contributions we might make. And depending on the context, we're going to have different roles of power. And so we are definitely not going to be equal in, in this kind of context. And I think that's, that's one of the big confusions. And the other thing that's really interesting about this is that uh, I often feel like people talk about leadership as it being sort of a scarce resource. So if I step into leadership, then I'm taking that away from others and then they can't. When the way I've experienced it, it's completely the opposite. It's if you step in that, that gives permission for others to step in as well. And that actually, it lifts everyone up so that we can all step into our leadership, which each of us might have a different quality to that, a different space where we're bringing it. Um, there's a huge diversity around that. So um, yeah, I think that like 
what's what's really important to emphasize on on this point around how we can all step into leadership in our own way is is really this uh, i guess assumption that if we're in a self-managing team or organization that my assumption at least is that we're creating it from a place of partnership and a place of adult to adult relating right so it's sort of moving away from this idea of parent child which traditional management is also very based on so the manager is the parent or the leader and um, the employees are the children but that we are all adults that are responsible for ourselves and that we all have an equal right to create the context that we're stepping into together and that's really important so basically in a way you could see like the the organization has a set of, of rules of the game that we can all contribute to and we can choose to opt out, right? And that's a really key piece. If I'm not feeling like this is actually the right place for me to contribute, I can decide to leave. I'm not forced to stay, right? And so I think from this foundation of we are all equal partners in that idea of partnership, then all of this possibility opens up for us to hold different roles of power in different ways. So I think maybe maybe this becomes a bit more clear if I go to the third myth that also sort of goes a bit deeper into like, what are these qualities of leadership? So the third myth being that leadership is often seen as an identity. So I am a leader, you are not, or maybe I, I have these certain special qualities uh, in just because I was born with them um, and therefore can be a leader. And I think the the notion that we really try to work with much more that I think makes it much more accessible to everyone is really leadership almost more like an adjective or a verb. So the verb being the act of leading that I can do in one moment and then I can stop doing it in another. And the, the adjective, which, I mean, this is a bit of a sort of made up word that we like to use, but it's a leaderful. So someone is maybe being leaderful in a certain instance. And really, I think that uh, leadership often not even being about what you do, but it's about how you show up and uh, like the way you are being in a certain space and holding yourself. And so I really think that um, taking this perspective makes leadership something that isn't just reserved for a few special people, but that everyone can start seeing themselves within and that any person can can have a part of. And so that actually brings me to the fourth myth, which is this uh, very common idea that leadership is really visionary leadership. So I think for, for many of us, the traditional concept of what a leader is, it's like we think of Steve Jobs or someone who's standing on a stage sharing a big idea. And while that is definitely a form of leadership, what I found extremely helpful is to actually start looking more into what are actually much more detailed facets of what leadership can be. And there's actually a, a woman called Alana Irving, a friend uh, who was very active in the Inspiral Network for many years. And she developed a concept that I think really beautifully articulates this diversity of different ways that leadership can manifest and that shows how visionary leadership is actually just one piece of that. And that I think it's super important for us to acknowledge much more diversity in how leadership can look to then again, make it more accessible, make it something that many of us can actually see ourselves stepping into and holding as well. And so I just thought it would be nice to actually briefly show this, uh, this model that she's created called Full Circle Leadership. And so basically uh, she's identified all of these different leadership styles, you could say, or like leadership profiles or types, you can uh, do like a little quiz and everything to find out what your what your type is. But basically, um, she differentiates on the one hand between sort of the, vi the more visionary types of leadership and the more operational ones. And also, um, I think the line is, uh, if I remember, it's like this way, um, if you can see my cursor. Uh, the more yin energy and the more yang energy. So just to briefly uh, sort of talk you through what these are. So basically she talks about the leadership of sensing, right? Which is a very uh, female energy. 
of basically sensing into the field of, of what's what's happening. It's a lot about listening. Um, the leadership of in inquiry, right? So asking questions, trying to understand what's going on, what are people thinking, also very much uh, related to, to deep listening. Then we have the envisioning, which this is basically the, the profile that represents the classic leader that many of us uh, are familiar with as a concept. Then we have the leadership of prototyping, right? It's like getting out that, that dirty first version and just getting started. And then what I find super interesting is, especially when we go into the second half, this was a real uh, epiphany for me in terms of how she was looking at this, that we have the leadership of evaluation. So trying to basically measure how are we doing with what we're doing, uh, of operationalizing, maintenance, and optimizing. And the idea really is that you can be doing all of these different things and be showing up in a leaderful way within a group. And that in many cases, what you, what you want to try to see is actually have teams and organizations where there's a balance of all of these different pieces. And that only when you have those, you can actually enable a project to really get through a good cycle and to like close and to keep going through loops of improvement and um, growing and evolving. And one thing that I find especially interesting, I don't know if those of you more active in Web3 would agree as well for, for that space, but a lot of the, the networks and communities I'm in, there's many, many people that are super strong on the first four, let's say. And there tends to be a lot less like maintenance energy, operationalizing, especially optimizing can sometimes be very low as well. And so I think what we often see is that there's lots of entrepreneurial energy to get things started and lots of new projects get kicked off, but a lot of them do not last and they sort of die because there's a lack of leadership energy around maintenance and all of these others. And so I think um, until we sort of shift our view to actually say, hey, guess what? Leadership can include all of these things. I think we're missing a huge piece and we're not, we're not able to really acknowledge and value something that really is... Uh, extremely important and that yeah gives gives value and credit to work that many people are doing and often doing without a lot of visibility without being um, acknowledged for that in the way that they should so I think on the whole uh, what seems really important here like if we look at sort of I guess one of the the conclusions from all of these different myths that I think is really important is that uh, leadership, the way we see it, um, at least in this, this new way of organizing, is something that's extremely contextual, dynamic, and relational. And so based on the specific situation I'm in, right, I might choose to tap into these different energies because that might be what is needed at that moment. It's not that I'm always going to be the visionary or always going to be the optimizer. It's, it's, it's based on what the situation demands. Um, it's also very dynamic. So this goes back to, it's not that I am a leader and you are not, but it's something that can show up in lots of different places, in different people at different moments. And it's, it's sort of a, a dynamic dance. And it's relational in the sense that we create some kind of frame or container together that we step into. And inside of that, we're consenting to certain power dynamics. And then we can step out of them, or we can also renegotiate them. And so I think that's really important that like, it's totally in, the, in line with self-management to say, guess what? I'm going to step into a project. And here, I'm going to say, guess what? I really uh, don't want to take a lot of responsibility. And I just want to follow the lead of, of this person, because that's the role I want to take here. right? Maybe that's my choice. And that's totally fine if that is the shared frame that the, the team is set up and that everyone has consented into. And so in that way, it's this relational dynamic and these roles that we choose to take on and that we can then also change. So I think the last uh, sort of idea that I just want to leave you with, and also there's a nice graphic with this um, that also Alana made about uh, how to grow distributed leadership is really this idea of self-leadership and I'm not trying to get you to read all these uh, details here. I can send the presentation later if you want to take a look. Um, this is actually coming from a, a book that I contributed to called Better Work Together. So um, 
that's just as a side note. But I think uh, what's really important in all of this is that self-leadership is the starting point for me. So before you're able to recognize yourself as a leader and your own power and your potential, you're not going to be able to see it in others and to support others to bring that out as well. So I really think that for, for each one of us here and for all of us all the time, really tuning into how can I acknowledge my own leadership and, and really develop myself that with that start starting point, um, we have the best foundation to, to create uh, thriving organizations and what I would see as true shared leadership, where we're each in our own leadership power and then coming together to, to make great projects happen. So yeah, I think that's what I wanted to leave you with. And um, I'm excited to dive into some discussion and hear some questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Francesca, for, for sharing. If anyone would like to chip in with either a question, a comment, some of your own ideas that you'd like to bring. Um, I know, for example, uh, uh, Guy was wondering about the question of source. He, as I was saying, we'll have a, a talk specifically on that topic soon. But if you'd like to bring it up, please feel free that the space is yours. Just if you want to bring anything, uh, raise your hand using the reactions at the bottom or otherwise you can type it in the chat and I'll bring it up for you if you don't necessarily want to chat. So uh, let's start with Uhtred of Bevenberg. Hi, uh, hi, I hope I'm audible. Let me begin by saying if you were the pop, I'd change my religion. Uh, coming back to your first slide, Francisca, uh, the quotation that was there is, I can't step in if I can see an issue because we are self-managing. Self -manage, managing. If I may flip the perspective uh, from that of a newcomer to an organization, if I come in and I can already see that no matter the quality or the effort I put into the organization, the value or the method of value capture is extractionary in nature, is my concern not a valid one? Yes, absolutely. I think um, I would say that if the organization that you're stepping into, if it is focused on value capture and being extractive, then it's probably, well, maybe, I don't know if it's self-managing, <laughs> maybe it is. And then it maybe doesn't have the kind of mission that uh, I would expect this to be in. Because I think a lot of these ideas that have been shared, this idea of not having coercion, power with being in partnership, like those are fundamentally non-extractive systems. That's the whole objective here. So you can't put this uh, this invitation, like, oh, just step in and lead into, into an extractive system. Then, then someone will probably, uh, could easily be harmed, right? And it makes sense that they then need to protect themselves. So that's basically what we're trying to almost like reprogram that, Maybe you come into an organization where actually things are different and there is trust and there is psychological safety and there is this notion of, of true partnership. But of course, um, yeah, you can never know until you're there and you really try it out and, and see what you actually find. So yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so I'm just feel sane now. <laughs> Something that that comes to mind from from that perspective is how much of the let's say the destructive organization pattern has to do precisely with other people not being able to to sense and respond and bring into the forum what it is that they need and decide, and instead of that is constrained by a very small group quite often an anonymous group uh, that them they themselves are constrained which is the issue we have quite often with investment is the, the VCs are forced to follow a certain agenda because their limited partners want something and their limited partners need a certain agenda because they have investors that if they don't follow every single person across this chain is going to get fired and replaced by someone else who follows this agenda. And that's how we end up with global anonymous finance that lead us essentially in the system that we're going. Uh, but D, over to you, please. Hi, I just realized, oh yeah, I left my... And up. Uh, um, I think this um, idea 
the you know we use this this term the leader full and people recognizing kind of their leadership and i think that we're just coming into spaces of i don't know this is just a comment it's a thing that made me um my daughter works in sustainability and we talk about biodiversity and i think that we haven't we're not able to look at leadership in biodiversity in that framework right that that you know lions don't lead the same way the rabbit leads i do a lot of animal renditions in that way right and so there's leadership and it looks different so it's almost like we've been siloed to only see leadership in a particular way right you know and so now we're kind of opening up to the possibilities of leadership having this biodiversity of leadership and so the best way for you to express your leadership is to you know, if you're the turtle or the bunny, right, you express it fully and bring it that's leader full instead of trying to dominate the entire ecosystem, maybe, I guess. That's how I would say that. Mm. Yeah, that's a really nice metaphor. Uh, Lisa, Lisa Woken was bringing something, but uh, I'll share in a second, just wanted to say, I really love the term biodiversity of of leadership, it uh, really aligns with a lot of the terminologies that are emerging. But anyway, uh, Lisa was asking, what are you sensing works well for reprogramming at the individual and systemic level to shift towards self-managing? A casual question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty big endeavor. <laughs> I mean, I think like everyone obviously has their personal journey with this. It's like, it's a very personal thing for how this, this happens. And actually, I don't even like the term reprogramming. Like, I know I, I put the word out there myself and it, it's sort of one understands it, but something about it seems too mechanical. Like I'm, yeah, changing some buttons. But I really think that embodiment is something really key in this actually working. And by that, I mean that this, this change, you need to feel it physically, what it's like. And I think to really develop the trust that something is different, you need to experience it. And I've got to say that one of the ways I was saying earlier, how I'm a very like practical learner, that the main way that I've learned is by putting myself in different systems and just starting to participate in them. And through that seeing like, ah, okay, this is what it feels like to make a proposal, or this is what it feels like to do that. And that, that was really one of the things that I got a lot from the Inspiral Network when I came in. So I think that trying to create experiences where people can really get that felt sense that like, this is what it's supposed to feel like when it's working. And then they can take that seed back to where they are and start, uh, yeah, recreating that based on that, that felt sense that they got. And the other thing I guess I would say is that um, like there's sort of this interplay of the system and the individual work that need to like go together and that it's very hard to decouple that. So if you're not sort of on your own personal journey and investigating your own beliefs and your own projections and all of those things, it's going to be very hard to step into something new. And at the same time, if you're in a system that keeps reinforcing those old beliefs, even if you're doing a lot of work on yourself, it's going to be super hard. So it's trying to find, yeah, sort of these stepping stones and, and finding a good combination of that, that personal journey that you're on and then putting yourself in context that will support it. So yeah, I think that many people are, are able to get these experiences now also, you know, thanks to online connectivity, different communities, things that people have been trying out. Like I've been talking to some people working in very traditional systems that have been joining DAOs <laughs> and just uh, doing that like on the side, right? Like once in a while, spending some time in it. And I think that's been giving an interesting way for people that are still embedded in other traditional systems to sort of get a glimpse and start experimenting and feeling what that's like. Yeah, I love that. Thank you so much. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say that. I love your list of um, four myths. And right now I'm leading a research team that's focused on what is leadership in DAOs, so specifically for the DAO space. Um, but one of the things that, you know, it's very like nerdy scientific, I'll throw one of our essays in the chat, but one of the things that it boils down to for me, and I love how you're talking about embodiment, 
is that you can have like a very scientific approach and have it be in boxes and things, but often it's just this shift in like recognizing your own worth and recognizing other people's worth. And so to me, any like leadership development program worth itself, SALT gets it really at this notion of like human worth. And so, yeah, I just love what you shared and thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. I'm curious to hear more about your research and what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, would love to see the paper. Michelle, over to you. Lisa's question gets so much to the meat of this, this shift. Um, and within the myth, like the first, first myth, <clears throat> my experience is that so many folks who are in positional power and there's a decision being made to try to move into self-management. Um, that the fear is that if I see a risk, I'll get voted over because we're so in the voting mindset. If we're not in the command and control, then it's this voting idea. I'll get over, you know, I'll get, because that's what I do as a leader. I just, if I don't like what somebody is saying, I just roll over it or I persuade them out of it. So the the, it's that shift from, oh yeah, I can't be, my needs won't be ignored either. The, the perception that I see, the risks that I see will not, my objections will not be ignored either. I have consent, right? So this is very tied into this idea of consent. Um, I believe self management So I'm curious about these DAOs. It's a little off. I'm, I'm looking a little about DAOs and I'm like, but y'all are still voting. What's, tell me more. Back to this topic of Lisa though. Um, and yes, as Francesca says, it, I was because what I was thinking, my response to your question was, it happens decision by decision, experience by experience, and um, decision by decision when my, and it happens for anybody, positional leader or not, when my objection the decision is adjusted to meet it without me having to necessarily everybody needing to believe it or understand it, but just we adapt it to my objection. When that happens, then what, what I say often is consent happens in the body and objection happens in the body. Sometimes it takes us a minute to come up with the, the um, logical um, justification for why I'm out of consent, you know, and then we can, but it happens in the body. So this embodiment idea is very clear because our body knows when we're sensing a risk. So um, that I, so I, so I, I was like, yeah, that idea it's, it's decision by decision and let's try it a little bit by little bit. And it's also true that if a positional leader is uncomfortable enough and they have enough power, they will tip the tables on the whole change towards self, self-management unless they're really supported in keeping their agreement not to. Um, and so how that support happens can be coaching, can be, you know, other ways, but, you know, a, a gentle but firm reminders, you know, by the group, whatever, but like, it's, it's just, it's hard not to use positional power if you have it when you sense the risk. I think that's mm -hmm. complete for me. Yeah, that, that, that resonates quite a bit. And, and especially the, the crux of it or, or something that I've been thinking a lot lately has been about how the the ability to essentially to have an influence without being understood and how fundamentally important that is for the whole system to work because we're so much operating in systems where we need to convince everyone else that what i'm sensing is valid so that's is respected and if the other people cannot understood it, understand it, if they cannot agree with my definition of the problem and my definition of the solution and my definition of the challenges or the risks, then they're not going to do anything about it and it gets discounted because it's been coming very much from this rational mind. And we've been trying at R&R, or at least I've been trying to nudge us towards that if you're sensing it, 
is true. I don't necessarily need to understand it for me to respect it and take it into account. I'm just going to accept that there is something there. And the more you can express that and we can unpack it together, the better, because maybe it's a bigger risk or something, then otherwise we're not going to get the full signal. But, but trying to start from the assumption that there is always some truth in it, but I find it tremendously hard to live by it in, in one degree, especially as, as you're saying, like when we have when we are afraid, it's so easy to use positional power and when we need to move fast, when there is trade-offs and things like that, especially when there is a big trade-off and we feel that someone is trying to push for something, but they haven't seen the whole picture. I find it super hard to engage with that. Uh, but I find it especially hard to communicate about it. Like quite often when I try to tell people these, they almost feel I'm trying to shut them down because they were offering a suggestion and I'm like, stop suggesting. I don't want you to suggest. I want you to propose. Uh, uh, like I, I, if, you have, if you're sensing something, go and fix it and I'll support you. But I don't want you to try to convince me to fix it because I don't have the headspace nor the time to fix it. And, and you'll maybe never convince me, like I, my head is too full. So you, you're sensing it, that is true and valid, but I really struggle to get the point across. And sometimes people resent it also, like I'm stressed and you know going blunt and moving fast in Discord, it doesn't help, but yeah. It sounds to me a bit like um, those are people that are coming to ask you for permission when you would like them to be asking for advice or input. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, just put it there and ask, even everyone else to to re, to give you feedback to refine it, but don't bring it as a suggestion because what you're asking is for other people to validate it. You don't need other people to validate it. You do need other people to add their perspectives so it becomes a fuller picture that is better, more complete, more nuanced, and so on. Yeah, I definitely think it's it's interesting. Um, also, Michelle, what you were saying because. Um, just most of the groups that I've seen at, when they start transitioning to self-management, they, they really fall very strongly into this pattern of voting on everything and wanting to always convince everybody. And my understanding is that the, the DAO space has, has go, like gone through that lesson fairly quickly. <laughs> I don't know exactly how most of the DAOs are looking at that now, but it definitely felt like at first, like, oh my God, like really... Are people voting on every small thing? This can't be like we already know that this isn't a good idea. So um oh. yeah. I, I think the there's something about yeah, the the setup also of being so asynchronous. And I mean what, what everything you were just describing, Daniel, like all of those capacities that one needs to be able to actually discern like what am I sensing? And you know, do I need some input from other people or do I maybe need a, a bigger group to yeah, maybe do some kind of sense making on it. Like all of that is very hard to do when you're completely remote and just avatars, right? And I, I do think that that is the reality or has been the reality of many DAOs. They, they are starting to maybe focus a bit more on the, the human connection part. But I personally have a hard time seeing how you're gonna really get to the, the level of operating that you need to, to thrive and be successful if you don't have more of like an investment in those relationships and, and in the communication between people. This is, this is, you know, very grounded in a, in a very ecosystems uh, theory, you know, like this is how we operate as natural beings in the world and to take, you know, and, and so, um, that's important to remember. And I remember, I also just have to tell a funny little story of the one little meeting I was at locally that was in the Dow space. And I was asking about the governance and I was asking about um, how that was set up, you know, because it seemed like it was a compatible thing and all the values were there. And then they were talking about voting. And I was like, Hmm. And I asked questions and then I, I, I realized I got, I, I would say I got youth explained. <laughs> like it was, I was treated as if I can't really know what I'm talking about because I'm older and this is all new stuff. And, you know, we, we've got this. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and this was a couple of years ago. So it's interesting to hear that they've gone through that, that, that the Dow space. I'll look, I'm, I'm curious because uh, I do think it's important. And then finally, I'll stop. But to say, I think 
it's hard for us because we're the generation that's making the transition, you know, and future generations will have experienced these these collaborative spaces more. And well, it won't we're you know, it won't be so hard, I think, as it is for us to wrestle with all this. Thank you for the space. Yeah. Uh, Dee, please. I was gonna. I was just exactly going to say that. So I almost feel like I raised my hand too late, which is that there's this kind of, in my mind, this leg of the race um, where we are in the evolution of transform transformative decision-making and transformative governance. And, and um, because I think when you were saying earlier, um, you know, wish people would just, you know, give a, you know, a proposal. And I think um, speaking as someone myself who has struggled with, you know, when you get that space, I think there was a really, Francisco, when you, you, there was a point where you were, where you had said something that was like, you know, I can't rephrase it, but it was perfectly said. <laughs> but it was one of these things where as we're doing this, people, networks, spaces are just coming into, we're so used to um, not being in our range of tolerance, right, you know, in our bodies and, and what we do to maladaptively deal with power as it's presented or not bringing forward proposals, it's a habit and it's very learned and it's very conditioned over time. So when people when when people have to express um they don't they're not always able to articulate like there's something and I don't know what and then you know obviously if there are deadlines and time and all these things it's like just tell me what it is make a proposal I don't know because I can't name it but I know it's there you know what I mean and it's like ah you know and so it's the time factor of helping people because I'm finding I'm in spaces where I'm having to really slow down and help people to tease it out. People do that with me as well, right? That teasing it out. And I feel like that is a part of the practice that we're sharing in this generation of now, where we, I mean, like where we are, I think maybe 20 years from now, it'll be so, people will be a lot more comfortable, but we have to recognize that the leadership that we are living in right now or, this, or the times we're living in, this was like 200, 300 year conditioning. You know what I mean? And so we are actually in a wave of, of change. Anyway, that's, <laughs> I don't know if that made any sense. I just wanted to say it. Yeah, I mean, I think that that also really, um, like that echoes with the sort of importance of coaching, like peer coaching in, in self-managing contexts. And it's that like helping each other get clear, needing a thinking partner, like I find myself doing that all the time with my colleagues that we're, we're all sort of helping each other. Yeah. Tune into what do we think about this? What do we think about that? And it seems like such an important exercise and practice to be doing, as you said, Dee. So, yeah, I think that's quite a muscle that we need to train. <laughs> um, I think I really wanted to just bring in this question, bring back this question that Guy posted earlier on, just because I know that Peter is here and it might be interesting um, this question about source, um, because basically, uh, so I think there's going to be a session in the future that will dive more into this concept, uh, the specific role, uh, this idea of a source being a, a role in any kind of initiative that a person is holding. And so the question that guy was asking was, how does this relate to leadership? And I was really just thinking about this the other day. So I was sort of curious. I have like, I have a, I have my uh, current sense making of it. And I was just curious how that lands and what you also think, Peter, if, if I may indulge you. Um, well, because basically you. the idea is that the source is the person who, who starts any initiative and that they have a certain special connection with that initiative and with uh, its vision and where it needs to go. And I guess, to me, in a way, um, like the source is definitely a, a role that definitely is a leadership role. Like the person who's the source is definitely doing leadership. But um, I definitely think that that the, that they are not the only person leading, and that it's almost like sometimes the source is taking on leadership capacities and sometimes not. Um, to me, it seems like it's almost like uh, one of the things that a source will do is step into certain types of leadership. 
And that if we look at the full circle leadership diagram there, there's also this really great thing called the, the source compass that has some of these within um, this as well, which is that based on the context, I as the source, I'm going to sort of pick different ways of showing up that are going to be helpful to this initiative advancing. But that doesn't mean that the source is the leader and that there could be many, many other people leading as well. Maybe their own sub initiatives, but also just maybe I as the source and deciding like right now, I'm not like, it's not the right thing for me to be doing any leading. And I'm just going to leave space for others to do that. To me, that feels quite aligned or that's sort of how it, it makes sense to me. But yeah, I'm curious uh, if you have any thoughts on that. Peter. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, and thank you. Francesca, I've loved everything you've said so far, and I follow completely what you've just said now. And actually, um, in terms of the way you're contextualizing leadership, I agree entirely. And of course, um, it depends, you know, being active or not active as the leader um, depends on the particular moment and the particular situation. So the source of the initiative as a whole uh, will spend a lot of time actually not doing anything or not in, act, in, in overt activity. But I'd like to give, um, in terms of the work I've, I've been looking at, the way I've been looking at leadership, I'd like to give another context to this too, because um, I've adopted in my work a definition of leadership from um, one of the leaders in the field of sociocracy, Gilles Charest, um, a French um, leader, I would say, of sociocracy. And his definition of leadership, is, of a leader is, um, the, the role of leadership is to look after and develop the people in your organization or your enterprise. And I've kind of adopted his definition of leadership, you may say I'm avoiding the question in a sense, but what I make the distinction between leadership in that sense and the role of source, the role of leader and the role of source. Because the role of source and what the source is concerned with is not specifically developing people, it's manifesting vision. And I find that very helpful to make that distinction because there are times um, that you know you can embody both roles and there are times when it's really important to develop the people um, and be in relationship and develop people in the organization but there are times when it's really important not to be doing that and just to say forget that I, the job has to be done right now and this is really what's important and that's the role of source actually to make sure that things are done at the moment that they're supposed to be done. So I, I, I just add in that little um, shift or change in the context uh, in terms of my response. Uh, yeah, thank you, Peter. Karen, yeah. uh, Tyler, if you like, yeah. Yeah, I had some some interesting flashbacks that were going on, right? Because I've spent the vast majority of 15 years or so, right, in in uh, middle management, trying to be, you know, the the enabler of leaders, right? Trying to bring out the qualities in others that I would like to see them have, so that I personally wasn't always reliant to be the one to make those, right? When you're talking about, I don't want to hear your suggestion, Daniel. I would make it a proposal, right? And or bring it bring a prototype, right? Right? Get a peer that feels the same way as you and, and it really comes down to right like how do you best create the culture to where all the people that are in the organization feel safe to be able to do that right and don't need to you know the last organization I was in my my general manager of the location we were at was an ex-army ranger you know nice guy but also very you know um, masculine in that per, per se right and and very uh conservative organization in hierarchy and, and progression and things like that, right? So trying to bring a more balanced feminine masculine energy approach as the leader who has to deal with that, you know, doing by, you know, showcasing by example, being able to be the the one that's listening and hearing and then almost giving therapy, but then having to pivot to be able to make the decision of what has to be done at that moment. 
and and then you know it's uh i would my my question for you francesca was is when you guys have been doing this with organizations do you guys see more success starting at the executive level down with how you guys look to implement or do you guys have you guys tried like an inside out approach where you kind of tell leadership like hey this starts with those that are administering to the people we have to be able to have leaders that can be full circle and if you don't have that you're going to learn by watching full circle in action and then have to adhere to how that looks because sometimes it takes an extra hour or two out of your day to be able to be a full circle practitioner and not just an authoritarian right yeah i'll try to keep it short because i know that uh, we're we're almost at time here but i mean i would say that the short answer is you really need both like you you can't do this without the leadership being on board like that's just impossible but um, I know that different organizations also work differently on this. But in terms of greater than, we really work with everybody on developing the organization and, and transforming it. So it's something that's happening at all levels. And the people are usually running their own experiments and trying to basically develop the structures in a way that makes sense for them. Because we really think that there's not like one template that you can just put on or an operating system you can install. But that it's something that they need to develop and take ownership of. So you're really needing to work at, at all those levels and just having one or the other is definitely not enough. Yeah, well, uh, unfortunately we're, we're over time. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut the conversation here. I'm sharing three links in the chat. Uh, the first one is a quick summary of Aaron Dow, but if you like to continue this conversation, you can join our Discord. The link is at the bottom of the first document that I share is uh, the Intelligent Glove link is like a long link. And there in, in Discord, we can continue this conversation. Also, if you want to have access to the recording of this event, it will be published roughly in a week or so in, in YouTube and you can see other events. And finally, there is the Twitter as well. Feel free to tweet and tag it and we can continue the conversation on Twitter as well if anyone wants to. Um, finally, if anyone else would like to offer a talk at any point or a prompt for one of these conversations, just send me a message and we can continue. Uh, these are obviously big topics as Francesca was uh, quoting someone that was talking about it in the 1920s with tremendous amount of insight. Um, we're not going to solve it today, and, and this is not going to be the end of it. Uh, we're perhaps at the beginning of a journey. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> we have it. <laughs> so uh, thank you, every, everyone. Uh, really fantastic conversation. It was a pleasure for me. If, uh, I'm going to leave, leave it open a, a few more seconds, but uh, start to close now. Uh, Francesca, if you have any closing words, over to you. Yeah, just thank you all for showing up for this interesting topic. And thanks, Daniel, for the invitation. It's a, always a pleasure to, to talk about this. Great. Thank you, everyone. Have a lovely thank rest you of guys. the day. Thanks, everyone.